They need to be able to stop these Russian attacks that are coming from bases inside Russia. So I think there's also a question of whether we, the United States, and our allies ought to give them more help in hitting Russian bases, which heretofore we've not been willing to do. I think if the attacks are coming directly from over the line in Russia, that those bases ought to be fair game, whether they are where missiles are being launched from or where they are where uh, troops are being supplied from. I think it's time for that because Russia has obviously escalated this war, including, as you said at the beginning, attacking Russia's second city, Kharkiv, which is not on the front lines and trying to decimate it without ever having to put a boot on the ground. So I think it is time to give the Ukrainians more help uh, hitting these bases inside Russia. This is my video update on this Monday, midday, May the 20th. Let's talk about some news. And of course, we are going to start things off with the helicopter crash in the northwest of Iran. It has now been confirmed via Press TV. President Raisi, along with Foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdullahayan, East Azerbaijan Governor Malik Rahmati, East Azerbaijan Imam of Friday Prayer Muhammad Ali Al Hashem, and several other passengers, has been martyred in a helicopter crash in the northwest of Iran. So the the helicopter crash and the fact that there were no survivors in this crash. It was confirmed around 6, I want to say 6.30, my time here in Cyprus, the announcement that a helicopter had crashed and the president and foreign minister and other high-level officials might have been on this helicopter that breaking news was announced yesterday afternoon and it was a very long day, a long evening as the entire world was trying to figure out what had happened. There were reports that Raisi, President Raisi was not on this helicopter and he decided to drive out of the area where he was meeting with the with uh, uh, the president of Azerbaijan, uh, Aliyev. And there were reports at the beginning saying that, that the president decided to, to drive out of the, the area because of the weather conditions. And then you got reports saying that the, the helicopter uh, had a hard landing but everyone was okay, and then you had more reports coming in as the evening went along that President Raisi and the foreign minister and other high-level officials were indeed in one of the helicopters that crashed. I believe there were three helicopters, but I can't confirm this, and two of them were okay, but the one helicopter did crash, and that was the helicopter with Raisi. Uh, once again, I can't confirm the, the three helicopter uh, news, but as the evening went along, it became clear that that the president and the foreign minister and other officials were on this helicopter. It had crashed in mountainous terrain in the northwest of Iran. Uh, when you looked at the videos of the of the rescue teams that went to the site, the weather conditions looked absolutely awful. A lot of fog, thick fog. Uh, in this region, rain, mountains, just awful uh, conditions. Makes you wonder why the why they decided to to fly out in in such weather conditions. I don't know. But as the evening went along, it started to become clear that that the outcome would not be good. And then this morning we, we got the confirmation. So our thoughts and prayers to the people of, of Iran, to the family and friends 
and loved ones of the of the victims of this crash may they rest in peace so we are going to have to wait for an investigation to see exactly what happened a lot of speculation a lot of analysis and theories as to as to why the helicopter crashed i say we all wait for an investigation and let's see what the iranian investigators the state of of iran what they say about this this crash after they conduct uh, an investigation the only the only conclusion that i that I can come up with is the weather conditions. Just looking at the video footage, the weather conditions looked, looked really bad. But that's, that's the only thing I can, I, I can say about this event. Um, I'm going to wait for, for the investigation and see what, uh, what the report says with regards to this crash. So what happens now? Um, the vice president takes over the role of president. The vice president, along with the, the speaker of the parliament, Kalibaf, who is the speaker of the parliament, and many people are speculating that he may be the next uh, president of Iran. Anyway, the the vice president, the speaker of the parliament, as well as I believe a member or a couple members of the, of the judiciary, they're going to form a committee and they have 50 days to organize elections. And that's the process that is going to take place. As far as the, the, the state of Iran, the functioning of the government, uh, everything is functioning normal, and the Iranian state, they put out uh, a statement yesterday saying that the duties of the government are, are uninterrupted and everything is functioning uh, as normal. So that was the statement that, that the government of Iran put out yesterday. So let's, let's uh, talk about some other news. And let's start things off with, how about with Victoria Newland? Oh, do we have to talk about Victoria Newland? Yes, we're going to have to talk about Victoria Newland. She's, uh, she's giving out a lot of interviews, it seems, since her her retirement from the State Department, from government life. Victoria Newland is now giving out a lot of interviews. And she was speaking to ABC News. And where was she as she was giving this interview to ABC News? Does anyone know? Is she somewhere in Italy or something like that? Or is she in, in the United States at Columbia University? I don't know, but the scenery behind her looks like she's, she's somewhere outside of the United States. Just a guess. I don't know. But uh, Newland, she told ABC News that escalation in the conflict in Ukraine is needed. She is calling for more escalation. She is arguing that because Russia is launching drones and missiles from Russian territory, that the Biden White House and the collective West, they should hit the areas inside of Russia where missiles and drones are being launched to target Ukraine military facilities. That is what Newland is advocating for. Attacks 
on Russian territory. Newland, in this interview, she actually said that Kharkov is a Russian city. So you have that admission from Newland, but uh, that is what she is calling for. For Ukraine using weapons supplied by the collective West, supplied by, by the UK, by the US, to use those weapons to hit inside of Russia, to hit targets inside of Russia. So if we follow this, this line of logic from Victoria Newland, which is that Russia should be targeted, Russia proper should be targeted because that is where they are launching missiles to hit at targets in Ukraine, then shouldn't Russia say that they can hit targets in the collective West where collective West weapons are being funneled into Ukraine? Can we can we go there, Miss Newland? If you're arguing that the U.S. should help Ukraine hit inside of Russia because Russia is launching missiles from inside of Russia into Ukraine, couldn't we then make the argument that Russia should go after the military bases where Collective West weapons are being transferred into Ukraine because that's, that's where this logic ultimately takes us, this line of thinking from Newland. There were definitely rules that were put in place as this proxy war started to, to develop. Two years ago, as everything was starting to ramp up towards this proxy war, say after Boris Johnson flew to Kiev and sabotaged the, the final chance for some negotiated settlement, I do believe that there were some rules that were put in place between Russia and the United States and the collective West. And I would guess that one of those those unwritten rules, one of those understandings that they, that they came to was probably that uh, you, you can't allow Ukraine, Ukraine military, to hit our facilities inside of Russia. And in return, I imagine that Russia told the collective West, we will not go after your NATO command centers inside of Ukraine. I imagine stuff like that happened. That, it's just a guess. But I think those were some of the rules that were put in place in order to, to fight this proxy war between the great powers. And of course, the collective West, they've broken those rules on many occasions, and because they have broken those rules on many occasions, Russia has also hit at NATO command centers inside of Ukraine on various occasions. That was Victoria Newland. Cookies. Cookies, sandwiches, and bread. <laughs> Uh, Newland, Newland. So the UK Defense Minister, Mr. Grant Shapps, he gave two interviews yesterday, one to the BBC and one to Sky News. And in his interview with the BBC, Grant Shapps explained that the West does not shoot down incoming Russian missiles over Ukraine because we don't want to be 
in a direct conflict with Russia. We don't intend to go and fight that war. Grant Shapps intends for Ukraine to fight the proxy war on behalf of the UK, but that is why, according to Shapps, the UK does not shoot down Russian missiles over Ukraine. And in an interview that he gave with Sky News later in the day, Shapps said the United Kingdom has been very forward leaning about the way that our weapons are used, including, and other countries didn't, didn't initially do this, but then followed our lead in Crimea, which we see as an integral part of Ukraine. The official also suggested that the reason Germany has for months turned down Ukrainian requests for long range Taurus missiles is out of concern that Kiev would use these over Crimea. Shaps added that he would like to see Berlin lift, th lift this self imposed, supposed taboo. He would like to see Berlin lift this self imposed, supposed taboo. Okay, so that is what the UK defense minister said with regards to using missiles to hit Crimea. I think another rule that was put in place, this is just a guess, was that as far as Crimea is concerned, if the collective West allows Ukraine to send missiles into Crimea, missiles and drones to attack Crimea, the Russian military will, will defend. Of course, they will defend Crimea, but they will not consider it as, as breaking the rules in place as far as hitting Russian territory pre-2014. You guys understand what I mean? I, I think there was some sort of exception that was made for Crimea between Russia and, and the US, NATO, the UK. Which is why Shaps and, and Macron and, and now even the US, and the US, not now, and the US have, have allowed uh, Storm Shadow, Scalp, attack arms to, to target Crimea and Russia has not come out and said, okay, you guys have crossed the, the red line as far as hitting Russia proper. So now we're going to target um, the UK, UK uh, facilities, or, or we're going to focus on UK targets inside of Ukraine or outside of Ukraine, like the warning they gave to the UK ambassador the other day. I think there was some sort of carve out for, for Crimea that was made when we're talking about the, the rules of this proxy war. I don't know. It's just, just a guess because, you know, Russia says you can't, we're warning you, don't hit Russian territory. But the UK, France, the US, they do seem concerned about hitting Russian territory pre-2014. But when it comes to Crimea, they're not so concerned, which to me, it, it, it tells me that, that there must have been some sort of, of understanding that Russia's going to defend Crimea. Russia will strike out uh, against Ukraine with uh, Western weapons, missiles and drones that, that attack Crimea. But as far as targeting the UK or France or the US, if they attack Crimea, that's, that's going to be a carve out. I don't know. That's just my hunch. I could be wrong about that. So the Telegraph, they put out an article, the UK Telegraph, with the title, Britain may not be fully prepared to fight a full-scale war alone. Major General James Martin says the army is trying to get back on track after years of focusing on counterinsurgency. So the, the major general, he said to, uh, to the Telegraph that the UK is not prepared to fight a war with Russia alone. He did say that the UK uh, can, 
can fight a war with Russia or is prepared to participate in in a conflict with Russia if it was if it was as a part of of a bigger military operation, a NATO military operation. So he did use the word alone. The UK is not prepared to fight a war with Russia alone. The Telegraph says, with the war in Ukraine and the threat of Russia to the rest of Europe, the army has shifted its focus to readiness for war. And this week, thousands of British troops were in Western Poland as part of NATO's largest military exercise since the Cold War. The rest of the article goes on to, to report that the UK is, is preparing for uh, a big conflict with Russia. That's, that's the appearance that this article wants to, wants to give us, that the UK is in a, is in a very bad uh, state, it's in very bad shape. It was not prepared for this type of a war that we're seeing in Ukraine, but it is now preparing so that it can fight the type of war that we are seeing in Ukraine. The UK military is preparing to fight this type of war that we are seeing in Ukraine against Russia. So that was the article from The Telegraph. And today, the 20th, marks the end of Alensky's term as the Presidente of Ukraine. As of tomorrow, Alensky becomes the illegitimate leader of Ukraine. And a couple of days ago, the WAPO, they put out an article profiling Alensky's number two, his entertainment lawyer, who goes by the name of Yermak. The Washington Post's article is Alensky's chief aide flexes power, irks critics, and makes no apologies. Andrei Yermak, a former lawyer and film producer who runs Alensky's wartime presidential office, is arguably the most powerful chief of staff in Ukraine's history. So reading this article, I don't know if this article is preparing us for an eventual Yermak presidency. Alensky Gan Yermak assumes the role of president. Or if this article is preparing us for Yermak to take the blame for the failure that is Project Ukraine. Or maybe this article is all about showing that that Alensky is, is not alone and he has the support of, uh, of various other people in the government. He's not ruling by himself and he does have other officials supporting him. I, I don't know. I don't know what this article is trying to do, but it's trying to do something. This article is, is trying to hint at something. It's trying to propagand us in some way. I just haven't quite figured out how the Washington Post is trying to, to propagandize us, what it's trying to tell us. Anyway, let me read you some passages from this Washington Post article. It says, no political experience in reference to Yermak. A former lawyer and film producer, Yermak, like Alensky, had no training to run a country, let alone one targeted for destruction. Yet, that is his role. Once viewed as Alensky's shadow, Yermak is now seen as part of a ruling duopoly. A ruling duopoly. Hmm. Interesting choice of words from the Washington Post. I said three, four weeks ago from that Time Magazine, 100 Most Influential uh, Politicians or 100 Most Influential People Today or This Year or 2024, whatever, that Time, that time uh, list Listicle, is that what you call it? And they had Yermak as one of the most powerful politicians and not Alensky. That's, 
that got me very suspicious. I talked about this in a video that I made maybe four weeks ago, five weeks ago, when I was in Athens, Greece. But a lot of, a lot of collective West media is starting to talk about Alensky's entertainment lawyer, Mr. Yermak, part of the ruling duopoly. The Washington Post says, chief diplomat, question mark. Early on in April afternoon, Yermak, who was tall and broad with short brown hair and was dressed as usual entirely in green, in army green, burst into a conference room in the presidential office. An aide had carefully prepared his seat at the head of the table with a notebook, pencil, glass, and two bottles of water, one with a clear top, suggesting still, and the other green, suggesting bubbly, but otherwise unlabeled. Yermak ignored his seat and plopped down between two Washington Post journalists. One reporter gesturing at the unusual bottles asked Yermak if he was afraid of being poisoned. Quote, I did not think about that, he replied, as he grabbed one of the reporter's already opened bottle and took a swig. He later suggested that he is probably Russia's third most wanted target for assassination after Alensky and the head of Ukraine's internal security service. Budanov. That's who they're talking about, Budanov. First Alensky, then Budanov, and then Yermak. The Washington Post, they're preparing us for something. What are they, are they preparing us? What are they preparing us for? What do you guys think of the comments down below? Because they don't construct these, these cinematic type of, uh, of scenarios for nothing. <laughs> you know, they, they, they want to take us somewhere. And, and what they wrote here about Yermak sitting down on, 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 on his seat or sitting down between two, uh, two reporters and taking a swig out of one of their water bottles and with the reporter asking Yermak, are you not afraid of being poisoned? Because we all know that Putin poisons, every, poisons everybody, right? <laughs> he poisons everybody, but they all survive. Anyway, um, if you want to be poisoned by anybody in the world, you want to be poisoned by, by Vladimir Putin because your chances of survival are, are almost 100%. But, um, but yeah, you know, Yermak, big, broad shoulders, Yermak wearing his green outfit, sits down between the two Washington Post reporters and takes a swig out of their water bottle. Are you not afraid of being poisoned, Yermak? And Yermak says, ha, 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 why would I be afraid of being poisoned? I don't think about that. I don't think about these things. Um, Yermak the Great. <laughs> I don't think about being poisoned. I'm third on the list when it comes to people that the Putin would like to poison. First it's Zelensky, then it's Budanov, then it's me. Takes a swig out of the water. They're preparing us for something. I know propaganda when I read it. <laughs> yeah. Great script writing, by the way. I'm trying to think. Have we seen a movie with this type of scenario play out? Have we seen a Hollywood movie with this type of scene where someone drinks from, from water or, or eats from food and, and another person asks, are you, are you afraid of being poisoned or something like that? I'm sure there's a movie that has been made with this type of, of scenario. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Let's, let's get serious again and talk about the Russian economy. 5.4% growth in Q1 from Kim.com. Russian economy grows by 5.4% in the first quarter of 2024. Retail turnover is up 10.5%. Manufacturing is up 8.8%. And construction is up 3.5%. Western sanctions against Russia seem to only have hurt Western economies with Germany at 0.2%, UK at 0.5%, and France at 0.7% growth. 
Yeah, those sanctions against Russia, they're working. <laughs> they are working all right. They're working to help the Russian economy grow and grow and grow. <laughs> and, and the EU wants to roll out more sanctions. Uh, 14th sanctions package, is that what we're on right now? Or is it 15? I, I think it's 14. We're about to get a 14th sanctions package against Russia, which will mean that in Q1 of 2025, the Russian economy will have grown by, by what? This year it's 5.4%. By 2025, it'll be 7.4%. 10.4%, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, yeah, those, those sanctions helping the Russian economy to grow. <laughs> Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, Bidenopolis. Thank you, Burrell. Thank you, Collective West. That's what Russia is saying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are out of the system. You cannot control us anymore. You can't tell us what to do anymore. You have no leverage over us. And our economy is growing, outpacing most of the economies, all of the economies, I imagine, in the collective West. Very generous to Germany, the UK, and France. 0.2% growth, 0.5% growth, and 0.7% growth. Very, very generous in those numbers. I would say that those economies are more in a recession rather than growth. But anyway, what else should we discuss? So we have uh, some more countries announcing that they are not going to show up to the Switzerland Alensky Peace Summit. The leaders of South Africa, Brazil, and China will not attend the summit. The leaders. They might send representatives, lower level officials, just in order to, to satisfy the, the U.S., because I imagine the U.S. is putting a lot of pressure on every country to attend this summit. So maybe South Africa, Brazil, China, they might send some lower level officials, but the leaders are not going to attend the summit. I said yesterday that Biden most likely will not attend the summit. Also, Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, Senegal, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Indonesia, India, Syria, Iran, Ethiopia, Malaysia, Venezuela, and other countries of the global south are also expected to ignore the event. It's a lot of countries. Basically, you're going to get the, the leaders of, of the EU and EU member states along with, I imagine, Sullivan and Blinken. That's going to be the, the Switzerland Peace Summit. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. So we'll do one more story and we'll get to our clown world. Just an update on New Caledonia and the news that France is sending more military into New Caledonia in order to try and put down the protests. So should the countries of the global south, should they start providing weapons and arms to the, to the indigenous people of New Caledonia so that they can fight for their freedom against the French colonizers? Is that, would, that be, uh, would that be part of the international rules-based order? Is that in the international rules-based order handbook? Or does France get to send their troops into New Caledonia in order to violently put down the protesters who are protesting laws being made on, on their territory by, by a colonizing France located thousands and thousands of miles away? Anyway, let's uh, see what happens in New Caledonia. But the, the situation looks a lot worse than what what the French authorities are reporting. 
And I also read that Australia might be sending troops into New Caledonia as well. Not sure if that's going to happen, but I did read reports saying that Australia might jump into this uh, conflict to help France out. To help out little Napoleon Macron. So let's do a clown world and wrap this video up. From the, where are we here? From the Guardian, G7 leaders to discuss 30 billion loan for Ukraine using Russian assets. Finance ministers will debate legality of using 270 billion euros in frozen assets and frozen state assets as collateral for a loan. So the G7 foreign ministers are going to meet ne next week, I believe, in Italy. And uh, yeah, northern Italy. And they're going to once again talk about using the Russian frozen assets as collateral for a loan to Ukraine. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think this loan, this stealing of the Russian frozen assets and this loan scheme, this is going to have to be nominated as as the clown world of the year, because it really is just getting ridiculous. Just steal the assets. Biden, Biden, Sullivan, Lagarde, Ursula, Blinkity Blinken, just steal the assets. Just get it over with and just steal the assets and just come out and say, just, just man up, man up. And just say, you know what? We're stealing these assets. <laughs> That's what Biden should, that, that should be Biden's speech. We're stealing the assets. What are you going to do about it? And yo, what are you going to do about it? That should be Biden's speech, right? <laughs> Let's see what The Guardian has to say, because there is a twist. They're, they're introducing another twist to the stealing of these uh, assets. Divisions over whether Ukraine can lawfully be handed an extra 30 billion euros 26 billion GBP loan drawn from 270 billion in seized Russian state assets are likely to be aired at a meeting of G7 finance ministers this week in stress in Northern Italy. In another test of political will over Ukraine, the U.S. has been canvassing support for the plan with the money intended to help with Ukraine's reconstruction or pay for badly needed arms. Okay, so here's the twist. Instead of giving 270 billion euros to Ukraine from the Russian frozen assets, instead of giving a 270 billion euro loan, the plan now is to make the loan in the amount of 30 billion, a part, a portion of the 270 billion. So the 270 billion, that's the collateral, but what they're gonna loan Ukraine for reconstruction or badly needed arms, that's what, that's what the Guardian says, to help with Ukraine's reconstruction or badly needed arms, right? The MIC is going to get this money. Uh, it's going to be a 30 billion loan, just a part of the 270 billion, a 30 billion loan to Ukraine. <laughs> but before the gathering of G7 leaders, the US and the UK argue that instead of handing relatively small sums, such as 500 million from the interest annually, it would be better if a loan or bond worth 30 billion could be handed to Ukraine with the interest paid from the profits generated from the larger frozen assets. The G7 states could back the bond with a state guarantee as a way of reassuring private investors, officials said at the Lennart Mary Security Conference in Tallinn at the weekend. The use of the Russian central bank assets as collateral would be a reversible measure until Russia paid reparations. Critics of the plan argued that using an asset as a collateral means owning the asset, which amounts to confiscation. It has already taken a huge battle for the EU to agree that some of the interest on the Russian assets seized by Western powers can be handed to Ukraine. <laughs> These guys. These guys. <laughs> the stuff that they come up with, huh? 
Well, of course, if, if, if you say that the 270 billion is going to be your collateral, that's basically saying confiscation, right? Obviously. Obviously, if you use, if you use someone else's asset as your own collateral, I mean, you're confiscating that asset, right? Okay. But if, very sneaky now, huh? Instead of handing, handing Ukraine the interest, the money from the interest um, accrued on the 270 billion, the, the 1.5 billion of interest that the, 200, that the 270 billion is generating, instead of handing that small sum to Ukraine, let's just, let's just give a loan of 30 billion to Ukraine. And that's a part of the 270 billion of the total money that is, that is frozen, of which will be used as collateral for that 30 billion. <laughs> and then when they run through the 30 billion loan, when that money gets used up, they can give out another 30 billion, and then another 30 billion, another 30 billion, until they get to the 270 billion, to the full amount. <laughs> and then they're gonna turn to to Russia or to the international community, and they're going to say, well, we've handed Ukraine $270 billion in, in loans over the last two years in $30 billion increments, and the collateral for that loan or that bond is, uh, is the Russian frozen assets, and Russia is going to pay you back. Russia's going to pay you back, <laughs> right? That's your collateral. Russia's going to pay you back. <laughs> bondholders and the and who are going to be the bondholders the eu member states <laughs> what a freaking disaster what a disaster anyway that's the video everybody the duran.locals.com we are on rumble odyssey bitshoot telegram rockfin and twitter x and go to the duran shop Use the code GETREADY15 to get 15% off most merchandise. Take care.